Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight we're returning to a work that many of you have written to request more of. And because it's so popular, I'll be giving away a complete recording of this book to everyone who supports this podcast in December, either by becoming a member of our Patreon or dropping us a one-time tip via buymeacoffee.com. That's a complete uninterrupted recording of this book for those nights when you just need a little something extra. You'll find links to Patreon and buymeacoffee.com in the show description, and I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Let me take a moment to thank everyone who's already done so and supported this podcast. Because of your help, I'm able to put out an episode every week and keep them all ad-free for everyone and it's very much appreciated. Now, let's get to the reading. Tonight we're reading the second half of a small but very influential volume of philosophy, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, first published in 1923 by Alfred A. Knopf, New York. Let's pick up where we left off in the midst of the Prophet's discussions with the people of Orphalese. And the priestess spoke again and said, Speak to us of reason and passion. And he answered, saying, Your soul is oftentimes a battlefield, upon which your reason and your judgment wage war against your passion and your appetite. Would that I could be the peacemaker in your soul, that I might turn the discord and the rivalry of your elements into oneness and melody. But how shall I, unless you yourselves be also the peacemakers, nay, the lovers of all your elements? Your reason and your passion are the rudder and the sails of your seafaring soul. If either your sails or your rudder be broken, you can but toss and drift, or else be held at a standstill in mid-sea. For reason, ruling alone, is a force confining, and passion unattended is a flame that burns to its own destruction. Therefore, let your soul exalt your reason to the height of passion, that it may sing, and let it direct your passion with reason, that your passion may live through its own daily resurrection, and like the phoenix rise above its own ashes. I would have you consider your judgment and your appetite, even as you would two loved guests in your house. Surely you would not honor one guest above the other, for he who is more mindful of one loses the love and the faith of both. Among the hills, when you sit in the cool shade of the white poplars, sharing the peace and serenity of distant fields and meadows, then let your heart say in silence, God rests in reason. And when the storm comes, and the mighty wind shakes the forest, and thunder and lightning proclaim the majesty of the sky, then let your heart say in awe, God moves in passion. And since you are a breath in God's sphere, and a leaf in God's forest, you too should rest in reason, and move in passion. And a woman spoke, saying, Tell us of pain. And he said, 
Your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. Even as the stone of the fruit must break, that its heart may stand in the sun, so must you know pain. And could you keep your heart in wonder at the daily miracles of your life, your pain would not seem less wondrous than your joy, and you would accept the seasons of your heart, even as you have always accepted the seasons that pass over the field, and you would watch with serenity through the winters of your grief. Much of your pain is self-chosen. It is the bitter potion by which the physician within you heals your sick self. Therefore, trust the physician and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility, for his hand, though heavy and hard, is guided by the tender hand of the unseen. And the cup he brings, though it burn your lips, has been fashioned of the clay which the potter has moistened with his own sacred tears. And a man said, Speak to us of self-knowledge. And he answered, saying, Your hearts know in silence the secrets of the days and the nights, but your ears thirst for the sound of your heart's knowledge, you would know in words that which you have always known in thought. You would touch with your fingers the naked body of your dreams, and it is well you should. The hidden wellspring of your soul must needs rise and run murmuring to the sea, and the treasure of your infinite depths would be revealed to your eyes. But let there be no scales to weigh your unknown treasure, and seek not the depths of your knowledge with staff or sounding line, for self is a sea, boundless and measureless. Say not, I have found the truth, but rather, I have found a truth. Say not, I have found the path of the soul. Say rather, I have met the soul walking upon my path. For the soul walks upon all paths. The soul walks not upon a line, neither does it grow like a reed. The soul unfolds itself like a lotus of countless petals. Then said a teacher, Speak to us of teaching. And he said, No man can reveal to you aught but that which already lies, half asleep in the dawning of your knowledge. The teacher who walks in the shadow of the temple among his followers gives not of his wisdom, but rather of his faith and his lovingness. And if he is indeed wise, he does not bid you enter the house of his wisdom, but rather leads you to the threshold of your own mind. The astronomer may speak to you of his understanding of space, but he cannot give you his understanding. The musician may sing to you of the rhythm which is in all space, but he cannot give you the ear which arrests the rhythm, nor the voice that echoes it. And he who is versed in the science of numbers can tell of the regions of weight and measure, but he cannot conduct you thither. For the vision of one man lends not its wings to another man. And even as each one of you stands alone in God's knowledge, so must each one of you be alone in his knowledge of God and in his understanding of the earth. And a youth said, Speak to us of friendship. And he answered, saying, Your friend is your needs answered. 
He is your field which you sow with love and reap with thanksgiving, and he is your board and your fireside. For you come to him with your hunger, and you seek him for peace. When your friend speaks his mind, you fear not the nay in your own mind, nor do you withhold the I. And when he is silent, your heart ceases not to listen to his heart. For without words, in friendship, all thoughts, all desires, all expectations are born and shared with joy that is unacclaimed. When you part from your friend, you grieve not. For that which you love most in him may be clearer in his absence, as the mountain to the climber is clearer from the plain. And let there be no purpose in friendship, save the deepening of the spirit. For love that seeks aught but the disclosure of its own mystery is not love but a net cast forth and only the unprofitable is caught. And let your best be for your friend. If he must know the ebb of your tide, let him know its flood also. For what is your friend that you should seek him with hours to kill? Seek him always with hours to live. For it is his to fill your need but not your emptiness. And in the sweetness of friendship, let there be laughter and sharing of pleasures. For in the dew of little things, the heart finds its morning and is refreshed. And then a scholar said, Speak of talking. And he answered, saying, you talk when you cease to be at peace with your thoughts. And when you can no longer dwell in the solitude of your heart, you live in your lips, and sound is a diversion and a pastime. And in much of your talking, thinking is half murdered. For thought is a bird of space, that in a cage of words may indeed unfold its wings, but cannot fly. There are those among you who seek the talkative through fear of being alone. The silence of aloneness reveals to their eyes their naked selves and they would escape. And there are those who talk and without knowledge or forethought reveal a truth which they themselves do not understand. And there are those who have the truth within them, but they tell it not in words. In the bosom of such as these, the spirit dwells in rhythmic silence. When you meet your friend on the roadside or in the marketplace, let the spirit in you move your lips and direct your tongue. Let the voice within your voice speak to the ear of his ear. For his soul will keep the truth of your heart as the taste of the wine is remembered when the color is forgotten and the vessel is no more. And an astronomer said, Master, what of time? And he answered, You would measure time, the measureless and the immeasurable. You would adjust your conduct and even direct the course of your spirit according to hours and seasons. Of time you would make a stream upon whose bank you would sit and watch its flowing. Yet the timeless in you is aware of life's timelessness, and knows that yesterday is but today's memory, and tomorrow is today's dream.
and that that which sings and contemplates in you is still dwelling within the bounds of that first moment which scattered the stars into space. Who among you does not feel that his power to love is boundless? And yet, who does not feel that very love, though boundless, encompassed within the center of his being, and moving not from love thought to love thought, nor from love deeds to other love deeds? And is not time, even as love is, undivided and paceless? But if in your thought you must measure time into seasons, let each season encircle all the other seasons, and let today embrace the past with remembrance and the future with longing. And one of the elders of the city said, Speak to us of good and evil. And he answered, of the good in you I can speak, but not of the evil. For what is evil but good tortured by its own hunger and thirst? Verily, when good is hungry, it seeks food even in dark caves, and when it thirsts, it drinks even of dead waters. You are good when you are one with yourself. Yet when you are not one with yourself, you are not evil. For a divided house is not a den of thieves, it is only a divided house. And a ship without rudder may wander aimlessly among perilous isles, yet sink not to the bottom. You are good when you strive to give of yourself. Yet you are not evil when you seek gain for yourself. For when you strive for gain, you are but a root that clings to the earth and sucks at her breast. Surely the fruit cannot say to the root, Be like me, ripe and full and ever giving of your abundance. For to the fruit giving is a need as receiving is a need to the root. You are good when you are fully awake in your speech, yet you are not evil when you sleep while your tongue staggers without purpose, and even stumbling speech may strengthen a weak tongue. You are good when you walk to your goal firmly and with bold steps, Yet you are not evil when you go thither limping. Even those who limp do not go backward. But you who are strong and swift, see that you do not limp before the lame, deeming it kindness. You are good in countless ways, and you are not evil when you are not good. You are only loitering and sluggard. Pity that the stags cannot teach swiftness to the turtles. In your longing for your giant self lies your goodness, and that longing is in all of you. But in some of you that longing is a torrent rushing with might to the sea carrying the secrets of the hillsides and the songs of the forest, and in others it is a flat stream that loses itself in angles and bends and lingers before it reaches the shore. But let not him who longs much say to him who longs little, Wherefore are you slow and halting? For the truly good ask not the naked, where is your garment, nor the houseless, what has befallen your house? Then a priestess said, Speak to us of prayer. And he answered, saying, You pray in your distress and in your need. Would that you might pray also in the fullness of your joy and in the days of abundance. 
For what is prayer but the expansion of yourself into the living ether? And if it is for your comfort to pour your darkness into space, it is also for your delight to pour forth the dawning of your heart. And if you cannot but weep when your soul summons you to prayer, she should spur you again and yet again, though weeping, until you shall come laughing. When you pray, you rise to meet in the air those who are praying at that very hour, and whom, save in prayer, you may not meet. Therefore, let your visit to that temple invisible be for naught but ecstasy and sweet communion. For if you should enter the temple for no other purpose than asking, you shall not receive. And if you should enter into it to humble yourself, you shall not be lifted. Or even if you should enter into it to beg for the good of others, you shall not be heard. It is enough that you enter the temple invisible. I cannot teach you how to pray in words. God listens not to your words, save when he himself utters them through your lips. And I cannot teach you the prayer of the seas and the forests and the mountains. But you who are born of the mountains and the forests and the seas can find their prayer in your heart. And if you but listen in the stillness of the night, you shall hear them saying in silence, Our God, who art our winged self, it is thy will in us that willeth, it is thy desire in us that desireth, it is thy urge in us that would turn our nights which are thine into days which are thine also. We cannot ask thee for aught, for thou knowest our needs before they are born in us. Thou art our need, and in giving us more of thyself, thou givest us all. Then a hermit, who visited the city once a year, came forth and said, Speak to us of pleasure. And he answered, saying, Pleasure is a freedom song, but it is not freedom. It is the blossoming of your desires, but it is not their fruit. It is a depth calling unto a height, but it is not the deep nor the high. It is the caged taking wing, but it is not space encompassed. I, in very truth, Pleasure is a freedom song, and I fain would have you sing it with fullness of heart, yet I would not have you lose your hearts in the singing. Some of your youth seek pleasure as if it were all, and they are judged and rebuked. I would not judge nor rebuke them. I would have them seek for they shall find pleasure, but not her alone. Seven are her sisters, and the least of them is more beautiful than pleasure. Have you not heard of the man who was digging in the earth for roots and found a treasure? And some of your elders remember pleasures with regret, like wrongs committed in drunkenness. But regret is the beclouding of the mind and not its chastisement. They should remember their pleasures with gratitude, as they would the harvest of a summer. Yet if it comforts them to regret, let them be comforted. And there are among you those who are neither young to seek nor old to remember, and in their fear of seeking and remembering, they shun all pleasures, lest they neglect the spirit or offend against it. But even in their foregoing, 
is their pleasure. And thus they too find a treasure, though they dig for roots with quivering hands. But tell me, who is he that can offend the spirit? Shall the nightingale offend the stillness of the night, or the firefly the stars? And shall your flame or your smoke burden the wind? Think you the spirit is a still pool which you can trouble with a staff? Oftentimes, in denying yourself pleasure, you do but store the desire in the recesses of your being. Who knows but that which seems omitted today waits for tomorrow. Even your body knows its heritage and its rightful need and will not be deceived. And your body is the harp of your soul, and it is yours to bring forth sweet music from it, or confused sounds. And now you ask in your heart, how shall we distinguish that which is good in pleasure from that which is not good? Go to your fields and your gardens, and you shall learn that it is the pleasure of the bee to gather honey of the flower. But it is also the pleasure of the flower to yield its honey to the bee. For to the bee a flower is a fountain of life, and to the flower a bee is the messenger of love. And to both bee and flower the giving and the receiving of pleasure is a need and an ecstasy. People of Orphalese, be in your pleasures like the flowers and the bees. And a poet said, Speak to us of beauty. And he answered, Where shall you seek beauty? And how shall you find her, unless she herself be your way and your guide? And how shall you speak of her, except she be the weaver of your speech? The aggrieved and the injured say, Beauty is kind and gentle. Like a young mother half shy of her own glory, she walks among us. And the passionate say, Nay, beauty is a thing of might and dread. Like the tempest, she shakes the earth beneath us and the sky above us. The tired and the weary say, Beauty is of soft whisperings. She speaks in our spirit. Her voice yields to our silences like a faint light that quivers in fear of the shadow. But the restless say, We have heard her shouting among the mountains, and with her cries came the sound of hooves, and the beating of wings, and the roaring of lions. At night the watchmen of the city say, Beauty shall rise with the dawn from the east, and at noontide the toilers and the wayfarers say, We have seen her leaning over the earth from the windows of the sunset. In winter, say the snowbound, she shall come with the spring leaping upon the hills. And in the summer heat the reapers say, We have seen her dancing with the autumn leaves and we saw a drift of snow in her hair. All these things have you said of beauty, yet in truth you spoke not of her, but of needs unsatisfied. And beauty is not a need, but an ecstasy. It is not a mouth thirsting, nor an empty hand stretched forth but rather a heart inflamed and a soul enchanted. It is not the image you would see, nor the song you would hear, 
but rather an image you see though you close your eyes, and a song you hear though you shut your ears. It is not the sap within a furrowed bark, nor a wing attached to a claw, but rather a garden forever in bloom, and a flock of angels forever in flight. People of Orphale say, Beauty is life when life unveils her holy face. But you are life, and you are the veil. Beauty is eternity gazing at itself in a mirror. But you are eternity, and you are the mirror. And an old priest said, Speak to us of religion. And he said, Have I spoken this day of aught else? Is not religion all deeds and all reflection, and that which is neither deed nor reflection, but a wonder and a surprise ever springing in the soul, even while the hands hew the stone or tend the loom? Who can separate his faith from his actions, or his belief from his occupations? Who can spread his hours before him, saying, This for God, and this for myself, this for my soul, and this other for my body? All your hours are wings that beat through space from self to self. He who wears his morality but as his best garment were better naked. The wind and the sun will tear no holes in his skin. And he who defines his conduct by ethics imprisons his songbird in a cage. The freest song comes not through bars and wires. And he to whom worshipping is a window, to open but also to shut, has not yet visited the house of his soul, whose windows are from dawn to dawn. Your daily life is your temple and your religion. Whenever you enter into it, take with you your all, Take the plow and the forge and the mallet and the lute, the things you have fashioned a necessity or for delight. For in reverie you cannot rise above your achievements, nor fall lower than your failures. And take with you all men, for in adoration you cannot fly higher than their hopes nor humble yourself lower than their despair. And if you would know God, be not therefore a solver of riddles. Rather, look about you, and you shall see him playing with your children. And look into space, you shall see him walking in the cloud, outstretching his arms in the lightning and descending in rain. You shall see him smiling in flowers, then rising and waving his hands in trees. Then Almitra spoke, saying, We would ask now of death. And he said, You would know the secret of death, but how shall you find it unless you seek it in the heart of life? The owl, whose night-bound eyes are blind unto the day, cannot unveil the mystery of light. If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. In the depth of your hopes and desires, lies your silent knowledge of the beyond, and like seed dreaming beneath the snow, your heart dreams of spring. 
trust the dreams, for in them is hidden the gate to eternity. Your fear of death is but the trembling of the shepherd when he stands before the king whose hand is to be laid upon him in honor. Is the shepherd not joyful beneath his trembling that he shall wear the mark of the king? Yet is he not more mindful of his trembling? For what is it to die? but to stand naked in the wind and to melt into the sun? And what is it to cease breathing, but to free the breath from its restless tides, that it may rise and expand and seek God unencumbered? Only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. And when you have reached the mountaintop, then you shall begin to climb. And when the earth shall claim your limbs, then shall you truly dance. And now it was evening, and Almitra the seeress said, Blessed be this day and this place, and your spirit that has spoken. And he answered, was it I who spoke? Was I not also a listener? Then he descended the steps of the temple, and all the people followed him. And he reached his ship and stood upon the dock. And facing the people again, he raised his voice and said, People of Orphalese, the wind bids me leave you. Less hasty am I than the wind, yet I must go. We wanderers, ever seeking the lonelier way, begin no day where we have ended another day. And no sunrise finds us where sunset left us. Even while the earth sleeps, we travel. We are the seeds of the tenacious plant, and it is in our ripeness and our fullness of heart that we are given to the wind and are scattered. Brief were my days among you, and briefer still the words I have spoken. But should my voice fade in your ears, and my love vanish in your memory, then I will come again, and with a richer heart and lips more yielding to the spirit will I speak. Yea, I shall return with the tide, and though death may hide me, and the greater silence enfold me, yet again will I seek your understanding, and not in vain will I seek. If aught I have said is truth, that truth shall reveal itself in a clearer voice and in words more kin to your thoughts. I go with the wind, people of Orphalese, but not down into emptiness. And if this day is not a fulfillment of your needs and my love, then let it be a promise till another day. Man's needs change, but not his love nor his desire that his love should satisfy his need. Know, therefore, that from the greater silence I shall return. The mist that drifts away at dawn, leaving but dew in the fields, shall rise and gather into a cloud and then fall down in rain. And not unlike the mist have I been, in the stillness of the night I have walked in your streets, and my spirit has entered your houses, and your heartbeats were in my heart, and your breath was upon my face, and I knew you all. I, I knew your joy and your pain, and in your sleep your dreams were my dreams. 
And oftentimes I was among you a lake among the mountains. I mirrored the summits in you and the bending slopes, and even the passing flocks of your thoughts and your desires. And to my silence came the laughter of your children in streams, and the longing of your youths in rivers. And when they reached my depth, the streams and the rivers ceased not yet to sing, but sweeter still than laughter and greater than longing came to me. It was the boundless in you, the vast man in whom you are all but cells and sinews, he in whose chant all your singing is but a soundless throbbing. It is in the vast man that you are vast, and in beholding him that I beheld you and loved you. For what distances can love reach that are not in that vast sphere? What visions, what expectations, and what presumptions can outsoar that flight? Like a giant oak tree covered with apple blossoms is the vast man in you. His might binds you to the earth. His fragrance lifts you into space. And in his durability you are deathless. You have been told that, even like a chain, you are as weak as your weakest link. This is but half the truth. You are also as strong as your strongest link. To measure you by your smallest deed is to reckon the power of ocean by the frailty of its foam. To judge you by your failures is to cast blame upon the seasons for their inconstancy. Aye, you are like an ocean, and though heavy grounded ships await the tide upon your shore, yet even like an ocean, you cannot hasten your tides. And like the seasons you are also, and though in your winter you deny your spring, yet spring, reposing within you, smiles in her drowsiness and is not offended. Think not I say these things in order that you may say the one to the other, he praised us well, he saw but the good in us. I only speak to you in words of that which you yourselves know in thought. And what is word knowledge but a shadow of wordless knowledge? Your thoughts and my words are waves from a sealed memory that keeps records of our yesterdays and of the ancient days when the earth knew not us nor herself, and of nights when earth was upwrought with confusion. Wise men have come to you to give you of their wisdom. I came to take of your wisdom, and behold, I have found that which is greater than wisdom. It is a flame spirit in you, ever gathering more of itself, while you, heedless of its expansion, bewail the withering of your days. It is life in quest of life in bodies that fear the grave. There are no graves here. These mountains and plains are a cradle and a stepping stone. Whenever you pass by the field where you have laid your ancestors, look well thereupon, and you shall see yourselves and your children dancing hand in hand. Verily, you often make merry without knowing. Others have come to you, to whom for golden promises made unto your faith, you have given but riches and power and glory. 
Less than a promise have I given, and yet more generous have you been to me. You have given me my deeper thirsting after life. Surely there is no greater gift to a man than that which turns all his aims into parching lips and all life into a fountain. And in this lies my honor and my reward, that whenever I come to the fountain to drink, I find the living water itself thirsty, and it drinks me while I drink it. Some of you have deemed me proud and overshy to receive gifts. Too proud indeed am I to receive wages, but not gifts. And though I have eaten berries among the hills, when you would have had me sit at your board, and slept in the portico of the temple, when you would gladly have sheltered me, yet was it not your loving mindfulness of my days and my nights that made food sweet to my mouth and girdled my sleep with visions? For this I bless you most. You give much, and know not that you give it all. Verily, the kindness that gazes upon itself in a mirror turns to stone, and a good deed that calls itself by tender names becomes the parent to a curse. And some of you have called me aloof and drunk with my own aloneness, and you have said, he holds counsel with the trees of the forest, but not with men. He sits alone on hilltops and looks down upon our city. True it is that I have climbed the hills and walked in remote places. How could I have seen you, say, from a great height or a great distance? How can one be indeed near unless he be far? And others among you called unto me, not in words, and they said, Stranger, stranger, lover of unreachable heights, why dwell you among the summits where eagles build their nests? Why seek you the unattainable? What storms would you trap in your net? And what vaporous birds do you hunt in the sky? Come and be one of us. Descend and appease your hunger with our bread, and quench your thirst with our wine. In the solitude of their souls they said these things. But were their solitude deeper, they would have known that I sought but the secret of your joy and your pain and I hunted only your larger selves that walk the sky. But the hunter was also the hunted, for many of my arrows left my bow only to seek my own breast, and the flyer was also the creeper, for when my wings were spread in the sun, their shadow upon the earth was a turtle. And I, the believer, was also the doubter, for often have I put my finger in my own wound, that I might have the greater belief in you and the greater knowledge of you. And it is with this belief and this knowledge that I say, you are not enclosed within your bodies, nor confined to houses or fields, that which is you dwells above the mountain and roves with the wind. It is not a thing that crawls into the sun for warmth, or digs holes into darkness for safety, but a thing free, a spirit that envelops the earth and moves in the ether. If these be vague words, Seek not to clear them, 
Vague and nebulous is the beginning of all things, but not their end. And I fain would have you remember me as a beginning. Life and all that lives is conceived in the mist and not in the crystal. And who knows but a crystal is mist in decay. This would I have you remember in remembering me. That which seems most feeble and bewildered in you is the strongest and most determined. Is it not your breath that has erected and hardened the structure of your bones? And is it not a dream, which none of you remember having dreamt, that built your city and fashioned all there is in it? Could you but see the tides of that breath, you would cease to see all else. And if you could hear the whispering of the dream, you would hear no other sound. But you do not see, nor do you hear, and it is well. The veil that clouds your eyes shall be lifted by the hands that wove it, and the clay that fills your ears shall be pierced by those fingers that kneaded it, and you shall see, and you shall hear. Yet you shall not deplore having known blindness, nor regret having been deaf, for in that day you shall know the hidden purposes in all things, and you shall bless darkness as you would bless light. After saying these things, he looked about him, and he saw the pilot of his ship standing by the helm, and gazing now at the full sails, and now at the distance. And he said, Patient, over-patient, is the captain of my ship. The wind blows, and restless are the sails. Even the rudder begs direction. Yet quietly my captain awaits my silence. And these my mariners, who have heard the choir of the greater sea, they too have heard me patiently. Now they shall wait no longer. I am ready. The stream has reached the sea, and once more the great mother holds her son against her breast. Fare you well, people of Orphalese. This day has ended. It is closing upon us, even as the water lily upon its own tomorrow. What was given us here we shall keep, and if it suffices not, then again must we come together and together stretch our hands unto the giver. Forget not that I shall come back to you. A little while and my longing shall gather dust and foam for another body. A little while, a moment of rest upon the wind, and another woman shall bear me. Farewell to you and the youth I have spent with you. It was but yesterday we met in a dream. You have sung to me in my aloneness, and I of your longings have built a tower in the sky. But now our sleep has fled, and our dream is over, and it is no longer dawn. The noontide is upon us, and our half-waking has turned to fuller day, and we must part. If, in the twilight of memory, we should meet once more, we shall speak again together and you shall sing to me a deeper song. And if our hands should meet in another dream, we shall build another tower in the sky. So saying, he made a signal to the seamen, and straight away they weighed anchor and cast the ship loose from its moorings, 
and they moved eastward. And a cry came from the people as from a single heart, and it rose into the dusk and was carried out over the sea like a great trumpeting. Only Almitra was silent, gazing after the ship until it had vanished into the mist. And when all the people were dispersed, she still stood alone upon the sea wall, remembering in her heart his saying, A little while, a moment of rest upon the wind, and another woman shall bear me. And with that, we reach the end of The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. It's been quite a long time since I first read this book, and I'm so glad I could share it with you. If you'd like to read it for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear more of, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or send me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. I always love hearing about the books you've enjoyed. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.